good to see you. And then we also want to give a shout out to everybody watching online on YouTube, Facebook, our website, listening on the podcast. Those in the room, would you make some noise for those attending online? Yeah, come on. Hey, hey, and, and I'm hoping that uh, I'll hear some amens today because it, it's been rough the last couple months preaching to an empty room, okay? So please help a brother out, help a preacher out. The spotlights are on me, so I need some amens. Help me preach this message. Now, my family, they come to the first service, and so last week they were at the 930, and then again this week they're at the 930, and, and I don't know if I shared this with you last week. If I did, I'll still share it again now, but like my son, he was he's seven years old. He was amen to me so good last week to the point where I said jokingly that, hey, son, I need to pay you later for that. And you better believe that after the service last week, the 9.30 a.m. service, we had a negotiation on how much I had to pay him, okay? And so we negotiated $2, which is not so bad at one moment, but that happens every single time. Like, I'm going to need some help, okay? So y'all help me today, and amen. And if it's good, say, preach it, preach it. If you got a hanky, wave it in the air like you just don't care. Let's have some fun here today. I got a word for you. And I got to tell you, today is Pentecost Sunday, and so we're celebrating and believing that the same Holy Spirit that moved 2,000 years ago is going to move again today and through our church, and so we're excited about that, and, Andrew, and as Andrew said a moment ago, next week's going to be fun. We're going to have a lot to celebrate then, but also here today. So I want to jump right into the text Because during these abbreviated family services, I don't got a lot of time, y'all. So I'm going to take advantage of every second that I've got. So if you got a copy of God's Word with you, turn with me to Psalm 42. Psalm 42. And if you're here in the room and you don't have a Bible, they'll be on the screen here. But Psalm 42. And if you're watching on a laptop or computer, pull open another tab if you're able to or grab a hard copy. But we're going to read the whole thing. We're going to start in verse 1. I'm going to read out of the NIV. And I believe God's got something special special for you. So lean in. Psalm 42 says this, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my, uh, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with him? My tears have been my food day and night while people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy. I wasn't quiet about it. Shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet Praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you. If you got a physical copy, would you highlight that word remember? Would you circle it? Remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day the Lord directs his love. At night his song is weak with me a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock. I love that, y'all. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? He's being honest. Why must I go about mourning oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Last verse we're going to read together, verse 11. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. For those that are taking notes, I'm calling this message, hold on for dear life. Hold on for dear life. So if you're taking notes, write that down. If you're not taking notes, write it down too. Hold on for dear life. Let's pray together. God, I love you so much, and I'm so thankful to gather together in person It's so good to see people's faces. It's so good to do life together. And we're going to talk about that more in a moment. So I pray, God, that you continue to help us to reach people, continue to help us to expand in person and also online. God, may you move in power. And God, right now we pray together, not just my voice, but we pray together for our nation 
our nation, so many are reeling from this pandemic. There's so much pain. There's, there's so much hurt. There's so much job loss by the millions. There's people that have taken pay cuts. Retirements have been depleted. God's savings have been depleted. God, it, it's hard out there. This life is difficult. And so we pray for our nation that you'd heal, that you move in power. God, we pray for our nation that's filled with so much hate, so much violence, in fact, would you pray with me right now? God, we come against racism in Jesus' name. We come against hate in Jesus' name. God, may love abound. May your church unite, spreading the hope that we have in Jesus. In fact, God, I know I've been praying these last several days that God, I know this, that, that we can't truly love others until we fully understood the power of your love for us. So God, may we love everyone, no matter if they look different than us, no matter, God, if they sound different than us. God, may we love the world in the same way that you love the world, for God so loved the world that he gave. God, I pray you'd raise up a generation to serve others, to serve those that are different than us, to love those that are different than us. God, may we lead the way. We come against hate and we come against violence in Jesus' name. God, we pray for a radical move of the Spirit. We don't need another move of man or another move of woman. We need a move of God. In the same way that you poured out your Spirit, God, at the first Pentecost, may you pour out your Spirit upon us. May you move in us and through us may lives continue to be changed for eternity because of how you move and how you operate. And we pray lastly for this message. God, I've done my homework. I've prayed. I've studied. I'm going to give it my all here today. But I know my yearnings, my, my, my skills, whatever I've got, it's not enough. I need your anointing. I need your touch. I need you to move through me. So move through me, I pray. May every heart receive what you have to say. Not a pastor, not a man. What you have to say, oh God. And may all of us leave this service changed, not because we met with a person, God, but because we met with you, a real, mighty, powerful God. You're the one we need. We love you and we trust you. And if you believe it with me, would you say amen? Amen. 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 If you can't tell already, I'm stirred up. I got more to go. I didn't give it all in first service. I saved some for y'all here today. So get ready for it today. Hold on for dear life. I, I'm sure that you, you said that a time or two this last uh, few months during this pandemic, like pandemic, like, like I'm just holding on for dear life. I look at my finances and pastor, you better believe I'm holding on for dear life. I, I, I look at my family, like I, like I love my family pastor, but I'm seeing them a lot <laughs> these last few months and we're just holding on for your dear life. Would anybody be honest like me that you got a little too upset at your kids one time? You're like, man, I shouldn't have been that upset. No, just me. Okay, I'm alone up here. All right, there we go. I got some people helping me out here today. Help a brother out. Like, like I'm just holding on for dear life. Like maybe you look at your job situation and you're holding on for dear life. Like maybe you're one of the blessed ones that still has a job but there's that fear, right, that creeps in, like, like, like more cuts are coming. They're, they're laying off this many people. People are taking pay decreases, pay cuts. Like, like Pastor, I'm holding on for dear life. And the most serious of them all is when it comes to our faith. I just know there's people in this room, there's people watching online, that if you honestly look at the faith that you have in God or lack thereof, you're holding on for dear life. Like you're white-knuckling this thing. And of course, I'm talking about figuratively, but I've got a video prepared for you here today that shows this literally. So before we show the video, I want to set the scene up for you. There's a guy, this, this really happened. This is not edited or Photoshop. It's not fake news, y'all. But this guy named Chris Gursky, I don't know if you heard of him, but he posted a video on YouTube that went viral. And this video shows him in Switzerland. He's on a trip with his wife. I can't remember if it was their honeymoon or not. It happened a few years ago. But they decided to go to Switzerland, and this guy, Chris, he decided to go hang gliding. Now, maybe for you that sounds awesome. I know for me it does, but maybe for you you're like, no, that, that's hell for me. That's not a vacation. I don't like heights. But no matter where you're at, I think you'll find this video interesting because, unfortunately, what happened to Chris is right before they take off to go hang gliding, because you got to go with an instructor, 
the instructor unfortunately forgot to secure his safety harness. And so literally for three minutes, Chris had to hang on for dear life. And I'm not going to show you the whole three minutes. We've condensed it down. But put your eyes to the screen and check out Chris literally hanging on for dear life. Check this out. And my palms are sweaty. I've seen that video a whole bunch of times, but still, like this guy literally holding on for dear life. And, and I, I know that we're not doing that literally, but, but again, a lot of us are doing that figuratively. Like just, I don't know, pastor, if I can make another day. I don't know, pastor, if I can make it another week. Like, like even get more specific, I don't know if I can make it to the end of the day. Like this is tough what I'm going through. And so for those of us here in the room, those of us watching online, if you feel that way, then the, the next question that comes is this. Like, what do I do when I feel like I can barely hang on? Like, like what do I do when, when everything in life seems so fragile, so unstable? I'm trying my best, Pastor, to get through this, but what do I do when I feel like I can't hold on any longer? And if you're taking notes today, I've got a couple of things that we want to pull away from the text and things that I think will help us, especially those of us that are hurting, those that don't know what's next, those of us that don't know if we can make it another Day. And so if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Number one, what we see from the text, the first thing to remember, number one, is that the house is essential. Remember, I want some help today. You help me out, okay? The house is essential. Now, maybe you're thinking about your house and you're like, I don't want my house deemed essential because I need to get out of my house, pastor. I'm not talking about your house. We're talking about God's house. Let's reread verse four, part of it. These things I remember, the psalmist says, as I pour out my soul to God, how I used to go to the house of God. Anybody felt that way these last couple of months? Man, man, I remember how we used to go to God's house. Again, I thank God for church online, but it is never meant to replace coming in person, gathering together. The house is essential. I remember the psalmist writes when I used to go to the house of God. And as you read the text, friend, you can almost feel how he feels as he writes this of how much he misses gathering together, how he misses his, uh, misses worshiping Jesus and coming together with the family of God. And, and don't answer this, but I just hope that you missed it too. Like, 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 I hope you missed it like I, I missed it. The house is essential. Well, why would you say that, Pastor? Here's why I can say that. We were all designed to do life together. Like, it's in your DNA, friend. We were meant to do life together. In fact, it's an oxymoron to ever say this phrase, solo Christian. Does it make sense? They do not relate together. You were never designed to be an island unto yourself. And this pandemic has brought a lot of bad things. And that's one of the worst things that far too many of us have reclused back and we are no longer engaging with others. This is not an extrovert versus an introvert thing. This is a Christian life thing. The house is essential. In fact, let me plan out your week for you, okay? Because all our plans have gone to the wayside, and, and we got problems upon problems upon problems, okay? So let me plan your week. This is what your week should look like. 
Number one, you gather together. And you've already started off on the right foot. That we gather together in worship, lifting up one voice to Jesus. But it doesn't stop there. We gather in worship, and then we should scatter in work. And I'm not talking about making a paycheck, y'all. I'm not talking about paying your bills. That's all great. That's important. I'm talking about doing the work of the ministry because my Bible puts it this way in the New Testament that you're a pastor. Wait, wait, who, who are you looking at? Me? You. You're a pastor. You're, you're called to ministry. You're called to reach people. You're called to be salt and light. That's your calling. And so we should gather in worship and then scatter in work. And then it happens again the next week. We gather in worship and then we scatter and work. And here's the problem. I thank God for youth camps. I thank God for retreats. I thank God for mission trips. We're about all those things here at the church. But the problem comes when we only gather and never scatter. We should reach people with the gospel. We should get out and about and tell people about Jesus whatever way that we can. That's why that we've leaned into church online. We're not against it. We're using it. We're leveraging it. We must scatter however we can. The problem comes when we only gather, but the problem also comes when we only scatter. Because you, at the end of your week, should be spent for Jesus. And if you're not spent for Jesus, the problem lies with you. It's not up to one guy with a microphone to do the work of God. You're a priest. You're a pastor. We'll hand out your pastor callers as you exit today. Like, like, uh, that's a joke. Like, 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 you're a priest. You are. And so you are called to gather and then scatter. And I can tell you that if you get everything wrong this year, 2020, get one thing right. Make the church a priority for you and your family. And it's not so we can pad some stats here at Christ's Covenant. We're growing whether you participate or not, but we want you to be a part of it because God's got a calling on your life. God's got a, I'm going off my notes. Y'all better watch out. God's got a purpose on your life. The house is essential. It's not for my benefit. It's for your benefit. Because if you don't get a part of it, I'm going to shout at somebody else, okay? So like, like, it's not for me. It's for you. You see, at the house, you have a place to belong. Doesn't matter your background, doesn't matter what color your skin is, where you're from, how much money you have or don't have, you belong at the house. It's a place to call home. At the house, you find security and strength. At the house, you find encouragement. At the house, you find healing. What are you saying, pastor? The house is essential. You should make it essential for you and your family. I want to illustrate this for you. I showed you a video a second ago. I'm going to show you a picture. If you could put this picture up in the room and then also online. I want to show you what a Peloton is. If you could see that, 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 that's a Peloton. Now, when many of us think of the word Peloton, we think of those stationary bikes. Am I right? That cost like $14 million. You get them in your home. By the way, just let me get off on my little soapbox for a second. Don't you hate their commercials? Like, you don't don't hate them? I hate, is it wrong to hate something? I guess so. I dislike them, y'all. I dislike their commercials. Here's why. Because they got a person, a man or a woman, they're riding this stationary bike, sweating so much, been doing it for like 14 hours, and they're still smiling. That's not real life, y'all. Like, unless you're Dante or Phil in our church, nobody else likes to smile when they're working out. The only time I smile, friend, is when I'm done working out. Nobody like that with me, y'all? Buff, perfect shape, don't need to lose a few. I call it the quarantine 15, y'all. Working really good on gaining my extra 15 pounds during this quarantine time. Telling you, man. So I hate those commercials. Or sorry, I dislike those commercials. I'm not talking about that, okay? What I'm talking about is the picture that you see. A pack of riders is called a Peloton. A pack of riders. In fact, this illustration I think is going to help you out here today because there's so much that you're going to see in a second that relates to our Christian life. And so I want this image burned into your heart here today. Here's the advantages of riding in a pack in a peloton if you watch the Tour de France or another major race like that. The first thing is this. The first advantage is that you are more effective when you ride in a group in a peloton. Here's what I found out. This is fascinating, y'all. When in a Peloton, you experience 95% less drag than when you're by yourself. 
Think about that. Riding solo by yourself, you get all the wind resistance. It's on you and only you. But if you're in the middle of the pack, you get 95% less drag. Well, what's that mean? It means the riders at the front leading the charge, they're literal wind barriers for you. Here's a second advantage, more speed. In a Peloton, you can also go farther and faster with less effort. This is amazing that when you're in the middle of the pack, in the middle of the Peloton, and you can watch this on TV, you'll see what I'm talking about. But when you're in the middle, literally the group is pulling you along. The people in the Peloton, in the middle of the pack, they barely have to pedal. Don't believe me, watch a professional race. The group is pulling them along the journey. You're more effective, you've got more speed. And here's the last one, and I think it's just as important as the others. You have more fun in a Peloton. Y'all know some of these races last for days, weeks. And you have more fun when you're riding together. In fact, this is crazy to me too. But if you watch one of these races, the guys and girls in the middle of the pack, the Peloton, they'll actually eat and drink. They'll be telling jokes, cutting up, laughing during the race. Like they don't pull over for that. They keep moving forward together. There's camaraderie. They're in this thing Together, and I got to tell you something, friend. This is a great example of what the Christian life should look like. That you're more effective, that you can have more speed, you can go farther, faster with less effort, that you have more fun. This is what the Christian life was designed to look like for you. And if you're riding solo, and how many of you know you can be in a room with other people and still ride solo? If you're riding solo, you're missing out on the life that God intended for you. But it gets better, y'all. In life and cycling, there's inevitably a group of people, and maybe you've been there before, that falls off the back. They can't keep up with the group. Something happens, or something happens to their bike, or they're just too tired, or they feel like they can't go farther or go forward anymore, and so they fall off the back. And here's the amazing thing about this, that team sports like this, because cycling is a team sport, What will happen is when one rider falls off the back, the team will notice and they'll send teammates to go get them and tow them back to the group. Isn't that incredible? They see somebody that's fallen off the back and they're like, you know what? They're tired. They're hurting. They need help. We're not going to move on without them. So literally, they will turn their bike around in a race and go the opposite direction, pick them up, tow them back. What's that mean? They gotta work twice as hard to get them back to the group. Why? Because that person, that teammate is important to them. And can you see the translation with the church, friend? When people fall off the back, we must not leave them. We must go back and bring them back to the pack. I hope you're getting this in your soul today. This is valuable. This is important. And remember, you're a pastor. You're a minister. And so it's not up to one guy to go back for everybody because how many of you know I'm one guy? Like you're called to take notice. And so let's make this practical during this pandemic. Who have you not been checking up with? Who have you not been texting or calling? Who was involved at one point, but they're not involved anymore? Let's not leave them behind. Let's do what Jesus did and leave the 99 and go after the one and bring them back to the pack. I wish somebody helped me preach this message today. You were meant to live life together in a group. It's your calling. It's your purpose. The psalmist is shouting at you from ancient history saying the house is essential. It's essential. It's not for my benefit. It's for your benefit. There's power when we ride together. This is community. This is what the church should look like. Can we just get real personal, real practical? That that when you hurt, I hurt. That's the church. That when you celebrate, you better believe I'm your biggest cheerleader. I get my pom-poms out, y'all, and I'm going to town just cheering and celebrating. I'm not jealous of your blessing. When you're hurting, that I'll, I'll get down in the mud with you. But guess what? It's not just me to do with hundreds of people. It's you to do for each other and for me. It should go all different ways. 
that when you're hurting, I'm with you, that when I'm hurting, you're with me. This is the church. And if you're not living this way, and most of Christians, unfortunately, here in America are not living this way right now, when you're not living this way, you are missing out on so much that God has for you. The psalmist wrote, man, I miss, I miss it. Like, I, I miss sports, y'all, but, but I missed more gathering together with God's people in God's house. I miss worshiping together. Number two, here's the second point. I just got two of them here today. Number two, we see from the text, and I could point out a lot of things. I've even preached on this passage before, but I've got some new things that God showed me. Number two, we see here that hope can't be canceled. If you're taking notes, write this down. Come on, you need this. You won't remember it tomorrow. Write it down. Hope can't be canceled. Here's what's interesting about this text. And maybe you caught it, maybe you didn't. But the Bible repeats itself in Psalm 42. I don't know if you caught it, but verse five and verse 11 are the exact same verse. And how many of y'all know that when the Bible repeats itself, there's a purpose behind it? In fact, I just think that the Bible, you know, God was like, you know what? This is so important that I'm gonna say it twice to make sure they get it down in their soul. In fact, if you ever talk to a really good teacher, they know the power in repetition. Like I'm repeating myself on purpose. Well, Pastor Ryan, you say the same phrases like all the different time and, and it gets a little old for me. Okay, I'm, I'm repeating it on purpose. I want you to get it in your soul and your heart. And verse five and verse 11 says the same thing. What's it say? Why my soul are you downcast? Why so disturb, disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. This is so cool because the psalmist here is talking to himself. <laughs> like, like he's not preaching on a platform to a group of people. He's preaching to himself. And I just feel like somebody, like, like you just need to hear this. Like, like I'm glad that you come and you sit underneath my preaching, but, but you need to preach to yourself too. Like, you can't just rely on, you know, right now, 25 minutes and our shortened family services. You can't just rely on that. Like, you got to preach to yourself. A lot of times when people talk to themselves, we think they're crazy, right? Maybe it's not so crazy. What did David do? King David, he encouraged himself in the Lord. Some of you got to preach to yourself more often. And the psalmist looks at his own life and says, you know what? Why are you upset? Yeah, life's not good. This isn't great. But why are you so upset? And then he pivots. He says, put your hope in God. He's not preaching to somebody else. He's preaching to himself. Like Ryan, I know that's not easy. I know it's tough. But put your hope, Ryan, in God. Put your hope in him. In fact, hope can't be canceled unless your hope is in the wrong place. Man, it can't be canceled unless your hope is in the wrong place. And as we read the text, we see here clearly that wherever we place our hope, our worship will follow, our trust will follow, and our praise will follow. So let me ask you another rhetorical question here. It's getting you thinking about the text. We're not just reading the text. We're asking the text to read us. Let me ask you another rhetorical question. Where have you placed your hope in 2020? If your hope is in your money, then your worship will follow. If your hope is in your family, then your worship will follow. And maybe those statements sound funny to you. Like, how could you worship money? You know, how, how could you worship family or a career? Like, maybe that sounds funny to you. And if that sounds funny to you, it's probably because you do not have a proper understanding of biblical worship. So I want to teach you something before we pray. Worship is not a set list on Sunday mornings. Worship is not a genre of music. Worship's a lifestyle. In fact, if you want extra credit on your note taking today, would you write this down? Worship is both an act and an attitude. It's an act and an attitude. You can worship in many different ways. In fact, let me break a common misconception here in America. It's very common in the present time. A lot of people think that you have worshipers and non-worshipers. Y'all know we like to put people in categories, right? Looking people up and down when we come in. Oh, they're this way, they're that way, judging people. It's unfortunate that so many people act that way. And so what we've done here in America in the present day is we've put people in categories as worshipers and non-worshipers, but that's not true. 
and the reasoning we use behind that is we look at that, that man who, who, who owns three businesses and nobody can tell him what to do. And so what does he do in a worship service? He's got his arms crossed. Serious look on his face. Looks like he's constipated. You know what I'm talking about? So, don't tell me to raise my hands. You know who I am. You know how much money I've got. Oh, I ain't raised my hands for nobody. And what we do is we look at that guy and we're like, he's not a worshiper. But it's actually not true. And then we look at that teenager who sold out for God and they're doing jumping jacks during praise and worship and they're doing backflips and hallelujah that they're singing loud and their singing is not that good but man it's worship and praise and they got a puddle of snot and drool and saliva on the ground it's definitely not CDC approved you know like they're going after God and we label them a worshiper but here's what I'm trying to break that misconception both are actually worshipers it is built into your DNA it is well, how can you say that, Pastor? Here's how, and I'm about to pray. The, way we can, the reason why we can say that is that guy, that man in our illustration, he's a worshiper. He's just choosing not to worship God in that moment. But with his life, with his actions, and with his attitude, he is still worshiping something or someone. They're both worshipers. They're just worshiping something different. In fact, we get our word worship in the English. We get it from the old English word, worth-ship. So here's the best way I know how to explain worship. It's that you place the highest value, the highest worth on God. And that's not just a song, even though it is a song. It's not just words, even though it is words. It's not just actions, even though it is actions. It's all of the above. It's an act in an attitude. Worship is a lifestyle. And so when you worship God, you place the highest worth on God. More than your feelings, more than emotion, more than money or time or energy. When you worship God, you say, God, you are more valuable than anything or anyone. And when you place your hope in the right place, hope can't be canceled and worship will follow. My hope is not in my paycheck, friend. My hope is in God. My hope is not in my circumstance, friend. My hope is in God. Last time I checked, God is still undefeated. Can I get an amen? My hope is in Him. Let's pray. Let's pray together. God, I, I pray right now. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Close your eyes. No one talking. No one looking around. God, I pray right now. I pray that, that something that I said, that you would highlight it in their soul. Holy Spirit, even if it's something I didn't say, may you speak and may you speak clearly. To hear from you, we need you so desperately. I go back to the first verse. It's my prayer, my hope for this church that as the deer pants for water, oh, my soul longs for you, that I want you more than anything. I pray, God, that you get us back to the proper place, that the house is essential. Do not forsake, as Hebrews says in the Holy Word, do not forsake the gathering together. More than ever before, we desperately need to do life together. No more riding solo to help each other when we need help to pray for each other, not get jealous of each other, to not hate each other, but to pour out love. We need it. I pray, God, I know we've had so many things canceled this year. Weddings that have been canceled. Graduations that have been canceled. Special events that have been canceled. So much has been canceled, but I pray that you give us fresh revelation today that hope can never be canceled if our hope is in you that you are steady, that you are secure, that you're steadfast. So may we put our hope in the right place. Why am I so downcast? I need to put my hope in the Lord. Every eye closed, every head bowed. Just like I did last service and just like we did last week and every week, I want to give you a chance to respond. The best decision you can make today and any day for that matter is to put your full hope in Jesus and Jesus alone, to surrender your life to him, to put your faith in him, your belief that he died on the cross, that he rose from the grave, 
to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins because he's the only one who can. He paid the ultimate price for you. Talk about value. Jesus gave his very life for you. Today you have an opportunity in person and online to respond. So if you're here today, you're far from God. Maybe at one point you were close to him, but all the mess that's going on in this life, you, you've taken steps away and you want to get back home. But if you're here underneath the sound of my voice and you want to put your hope in Jesus, you want to surrender your life to him. If that's you, I'm not going to embarrass you, not going to make you stand, not going to usher you off to another room, but right where you're seated, I want to know who I'm praying for. So if you want to surrender your life to Jesus, would you raise your hand so I can see it? God, you're so good. Thank you so much. You can put it down. Thank you. So good. Just like last service. Thank you, God. Respond online as well. Here's what we want to do. No one looking still. I want to lead those of you that raised your hand. I want to lead you in a prayer. I'm going to ask you here in just a moment to repeat after me. And one of the great things about us joining together in person again is that you will not be the only voice you hear. There's going to be people all around you. Even if you're watching online, you're going to hear people in this room confessing their faith, putting their faith in Jesus. And it's a signal to you, it's a sign to you that we're saying, welcome home. Come on and join the pack. Let's do life together. Let's run after Jesus together. And so the hands that were raised a moment ago and also everyone as support, would you say this after me? Jesus, thank you for your love, for your grace, and for your mercy. Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross, that you rose from the grave. And right now, I ask you to forgive me of all my sin, I put my faith, my trust, and my hope in you. Holy Spirit, help me to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. Come on, say that again. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Come on, will somebody get a little bit rowdy? Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you sensed God's presence. If you made a decision for Jesus Christ, or if your life has been impacted in any way, please send us an email at info at ChristCub.net. We would love to hear your story. And for those that committed your life to Christ, we want to help you on your new journey by sending our free Start Bible Kit in the mail. If you'd like to partner with us financially, simply click on the Give tab at ChristCub.net. There it will take you to a safe and secure page where you can set up a one-time or recurring gift to help us accomplish our vision, heaven full and hell empty. And as always, you can find out more about Christ Covenant on our website or on Facebook or Instagram at Christ Cove Houston.